Good morning, and thank you for joining us for Protocol Summit on the Transformation of Work. Like me, I'm sure you've participated in numerous conversations recently on the changing nature of work. Discussions of Zoom meetings, temperature checks, plexiglass, and masks, all mostly attended from well home. That is not our conversation today. Yes, the pandemic has shifted how and where we work, but most importantly, this pandemic has driven record unemployment and in parallel, a social reawakening to the inequalities in access to education and skills training, technology itself, and the availability and inclusion of all people to the jobs that will drive our economy forward. This workforce juggernaut sits at the intersection of technology, workforce, and education the matching of the demand and supply of skills and talent. How can we get consensus on what specific skills employers are demanding, how these skills can be taught and certified at scale, the role technology should play, and of course, who should pay for it? At Protocol, we believe that technology is no longer just an industry, but a true power center. And in these historic times, we want to go deep on its role in these complex issues. We have some great speakers today to help us start to unpack these issues. And we're so pleased to be partnering with Workday on this important topic. Workday is a leading provider of enterprise and cloud applications for finance and human resources to medium and large companies. As importantly, they are committed to being a thought partner in the workforce development space. We especially look forward to their new white paper that Workday is releasing today on skills, credentials, and the future of workforce, which we'll share after this event. Jim Shaughnessy, who is joining us today, is Workday's Executive Vice President for Corporate Affairs and is responsible for the company's work across policy and public affairs and its corporate development initiatives. Jim has more than 25 years of experience as a strategic legal and business executives for numerous technology companies, including PeopleSoft, Lenovo Group, Orbitz Worldwide, Hewlett Packard, Compact Computer, and Digital Equipment. Jim holds a JD and a master's degree in public policy from the University of Michigan and a bachelor's degree from Northern Michigan University. Jim, welcome to the summit. Thank you for our partnership and we appreciate it. Let's get, turn it over to you. Thank you, Tammy. I was able to tell everyone on my brand of webcam. Isn't that um, exciting? Uh, apologize for that. Uh, but what would a talk be without at least uh, on Zoom without at least one technical glitch? Uh, we very much appreciate the opportunity to be here today because technology is reshaping the way that we work. Recently, data-driven technologies like artificial intelligence have accelerated workplace changes. A recent Brookings Institution study found that the number of U.S. jobs requiring high levels of digital skills more than quadrupled over the past 20 years, from 5 to 23 percent. During the same period, the number of jobs requiring few digital skills fell from 56% to less than 30%. Compounding these changes, the COVID-19 pandemic has deeply affected workers in just a few short months. Many jobs have been lost, others are on hold, and even jobs that remain have been changed dramatically. Simultaneously, recent events have brought to the forefront the pressing need to guarantee social justice and equality for all, including an immediate end to discrimination in the workplace. Make no mistake, the task facing us all is urgent. Business leaders and policymakers must act to ensure that workers and employers have the tools they need to navigate rapid workforce changes with agility. With a customer community of more than 44 million workers employed by 3,200 companies, we've learned a lot operating at the intersection of technology and the workforce. Today, I'll offer a few insights as a starting point in the conversation about coping with the transformation of work. Whether used to address labor market changes wrought by a once in a century public health crisis or to prepare workers for long-term technology shifts, traditional workforce development methods are increasingly falling short of what's needed. In the not too distant past, workers could, 
by and large, choose among three options to chart a course for success, vocational training, college degrees, or on-the-job training. However, these approaches alone are no longer effective for everyone. This is particularly true for mid to late career workers and those skilled through non-traditional pathways. And the most vulnerable are often at the greatest risk of being left behind. At the same time employees deal with workplace uncertainty, employers are struggling to find qualified workers to fill new and emerging roles. How can we meet the complementary needs of workers and employers? Fortunately, the technologies that are driving workforce changes also provide tools to help navigate those changes. Here are three examples of how technology will address some of our biggest workforce challenges. First, machine learning powered applications are already recognizing patterns in large uh, data skill sets uh, and helping companies understand their uh, understand their organizational skills gaps. Second, machine learning will also inform reskilling efforts, allowing governments and employers to design training programs around the skills workers need most. Third, blockchain technology makes it possible to offer digital credentials at scale in a way that's reliable, verified, and under the worker's control. So what's next? Beyond the technology itself, both government and industry need to proactively chart a path forward. The private sector has a key role to play in addressing workforce challenges. While industry has taken steps to drive retraining programs, there is much more to do. Employers need to adopt a skills-first approach to talent by shifting toward a culture of continuous learning and meaningful skills development. For example, Walmart recently announced an expansion of their educational initiative, Live Better You, to include in-demand skilled trades and digital skills program. Other actions for the private sector include embracing digital credentialing at scale, with workers benefiting from employers helping to translate their experience and skills into credentials. The role for government should include compiling better data sets. Specifically, policymakers should modernize current tools like the Department of Labor's ONET Occupational Survey. We should also develop an open data infrastructure to incentivize private sector sharing of workforce-related information. Government should encourage credential interoperability and promote accreditation measures for non-degree education programs that offer credentials. Finally, policymakers should encourage employer-led reskilling efforts through grant matching programs and tax incentives. Specifically, Workday supports the passage of Senator Warner's and Congressman Krishnamoorthy's Investing in American Workers Act, which would establish a worker retaining, retaining tax credit. Of course, these proposals only scratch the surface. Looking to the future, the only constant we can count on is the accelerating pace of workforce change. The artificial re intelligence revolution is underway. Coupled with the impacts of COVID-19 and the imperative of promoting social justice, there will be generational labor market shifts. But with the right combination of worker-focused technology, consistent private sector engagement, and smart public policy, we can look forward to increased economic growth expanded employment opportunities, and enhanced agility to support, protect, and prepare the workforce of the future. Workday delves deeper into these issues in a white paper we are releasing today that will be made available to all summit participants. Let me close by saying that Workday is pleased to partner with Protocol to facilitate discussion of these important issues. Many thanks to the members of Congress, panelists, and all of you for joining today's summit. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Issy Lepowski. I am a senior reporter for Protocol, and I am joined today by uh, Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester, who is the co-chair of the Future of Work Caucus. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Can you hear me, Izzy? I can. And can you hear me okay? I can. I'm trying to uh, situate things because I am this shows the future of work. I'm in two places at the same time. So I'm, exactly. I'm watching a committee on one laptop and I'm here with you on another. So this is the modern way of work. I, we appreciate you making the time on this busy, busy day and this busy, busy time. Um, 
so before we get started, if anybody has questions for the Congresswoman, um, you can type them into your Q&A box at the bottom of the screen if you're on Zoom. And if you're not joining us on Zoom, if you're joining us on another live stream, uh, you can send us your questions on Twitter. We're using the hashtag, hashtag transformation of work, and I will pass them along. Okay, so uh, Congresswoman, you started the Future of Work Caucus just a few months ago when, as you said, we were in a very, very different economic reality in this country. So tell us a little bit about what was on your to-do list back then for this group and how has that morphed and changed over the last few months? Right, well, first of all, thank you so much for hosting this. Um, I think this conversation is more relevant now more than ever. Um, when I first began the thought of even focusing on this, I, I was elected in 2016 and I had never run for anything before and ran for Congress. And I had had a background serving as Delaware Secretary of Labor, Head of State Personnel, and also Urban League CEO, where economic improvement and development was important. And I started having all these meetings, whether it was corpor corporations or universities, even our newspaper, and everybody was talking about the future of whatever it was. And um, I really got concerned because what I noticed was that there was not a um, sort of a North Star or a common a vision for where we were going as a country. And I was seeing one member of Congress was introducing bills on autonomous vehicles. Another was introducing bills um, dealing with classification of employees. Um, but there really wasn't this place where we could kind of come together and focus as a country. And so um, the, the real thought here was to create a bipartisan caucus um, that would allow us to talk across party lines and um, focus on being a convener, number one, that was the intention. Uh, number two, a clearinghouse, so that there was sort of a one place where many of these ideas were, were being put together. And lastly, the hope was that we would be able to start having real serious dialogue to develop a vision for our country. So that was the intention, that's how it started. Um, we had our kickoff earlier this year, which was standing room only. I mean, you couldn't even, members were being turned away because there were so many people from the black mayors in our country uh, association to the unions, to the chambers. I mean, it was just that much interest. Um, as you said, then COVID-19 hit. And it really shifted um, the, the focus for us because for members of Congress, just like my colleague, uh, Representative Steele, uh, Style, who is my co-chair, our focus really had to be on that pandemic and how we deal with that. So um, it started this year, we kicked it off. Um, those were some of the goals and uh, I welcome any more questions you have. So what were some of the policy priorities that came up in that kickoff and um, that you hope to maybe get to later this year or in the next session? Any specific policy proposals? Well, the, the kickoff was more of a coming together to see the diversity of who actually was interested in this issue. Um, and so since then, um, we've been able to have conversations on uh, issues surrounding uh, benefits um, surrounding, uh, you know, right now, because of COVID-19, it's really not only shifted uh, the conversation, but it's made us go into action um, beyond the caucus itself. Um, as a Congress, we really had to take a step back and, and, and think about what COVID-19 did. Um, I think it did two things, and it really, again, fits this conversation. One, it shined a light on what we already knew existed in terms of inequities in our in our society um, and magnified those things, but it also accelerated the future of work. So while we were having conversations initially about artificial intelligence, machine learning, how you know broadband, the necessity for broadband um, in our society, COVID-19 brought to fruition all the things we talked about. For, for decades, distance learning. We've been talking about that for a long time. Um, that's not new, um, but it made it a reality. Um, telework, as we've talked about uh, here, um, it made a, a reality. And what are the implications for even real estate? If an employer is saying, I've, I've heard employers say, we're not going back to renting all of this space when we're being even more effective in this, this way. And then telehealth. 
the fact that um, before this, one of my colleagues said, one of my Republican colleagues said about 13% penetration in telehealth and telemedicine. But after COVID-19, it's skyrocketed to over 80%. So it's had us not just um, talk about the issues, but actually be forced to, to talk, really do something about the issues, um, including benefits. Right, right. So on, on the topic of remote work, you know, we're here to talk about, you know, bringing more people into the workforce with the skills they need. How do you think this shift to remote work might uh, open up opportunities for people with different skill sets in different parts of the country? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I just uh, hot off the press th this morning, I was talking to our Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and Cleveland, and they just put out a document. It's exploring a skills based approach to occupational mobility. And it's really interesting. I haven't delved deeply into it yet, but one of the things that it talks about is the fact that we have these jobs. When I started this Future of Work Caucus, um, I had research that showed six out of the top 10 jobs that African-Americans hold were at risk from automation. Hmm. Well, then COVID happened and it was like all of a sudden everything flipped. All those jobs, like the, you know, um, the, the people that are delivering food, the, the, you know, all of these jobs, all of a sudden they, the people on the front lines become essential workers. And so one of the things that this report looks at is, are there jobs that are, were at risk from automation um, that were low wage jobs that with a certain credential or with um, the, um, uh, the, the right shift in their skill sets could then, um, increase their wages and and create upward mobility. And this report so far is showing that for many of these jobs, they're now calling opportunity um, occupations. These opportunity occupations, they almost double the salary with the right skills. And so that means for the nonprofit sector, for the government sector, for the private sector, what kind of things can we do to incentivize and enable people to shift to those new skills that they need. Um, but the incentives need to go two ways, right? So you need to incentivize the workers to get the skills, but then you need to incentivize the employers to look at those skills and say, it doesn't matter if you don't have a degree from Yale, I'm still gonna hire you. Exactly. How does Congress do that? How do you incentivize that? Well, I think, you know, it, earlier was mentioned, um, uh, Senator Warner and uh, Representative Christian Morthy um, have legislation, you know, that really looks at worker training. I think even our workforce investment boards that we already have that are existing, um, looking at, you know, the transferability of the skills, not just, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like what, what kind of, and the portability of the skills. Um, I used to hire people. And I remember there was like a certain criteria. Did you get this particular, you know, credential? And if you didn't, you, the system automatically kicked you out. So I think we're even as HR departments, as, uh, as companies, we as government can incentivize them by, by tax credits and um, making sure that the resources are going there, um, but also in providing flexibility, um, even in how we classify you know, positions, um, I think is going to be um, a, a difference. Um, this moment right now, I, I mean, like even the idea of um, the interoperability, the, the piece where this job, it, it, it was said to be, um, you got a job here, but can those skills transfer? Can you still go to another employer and take those same skills? Um, we've seen companies even doing things where they're training employees in areas that are not what their mission is. Um, I went to Amazon and they were training people to be phlebotomists because the wages that they were gonna, the employees were gonna make as phlebotomists or CDL um, drivers was gonna be higher than what they were making um, right there at the distribution center. So I think it's gonna be a public private partnership that's gonna make the difference. Got it. So you've sort of set in all of these seats, you, you're, you're in government, you, you were in state government with, as Secretary of Labor, and you were the head of the National Urban League in, in Delaware, where you were looking to you know, promote advancement of economic equality. Um, you've seen these conversations, I'm sure, for years about the skills gap, right? I have covering tech. Um, why have we done so much talking and not enough accomplishing? And what are the biggest barriers that you saw in all of those seats to actually closing the skills gap? You know, I, 
I think that's why COVID-19 is like such a, um, a transformational moment. And also what we're seeing in terms of, um, you know, the racial justice issues that we're seeing. Because for me, I, I think COVID-19 accelerated and pushed us to move. I mean, we've had conversations about um, paid, paid sick time for years. We've had uh, conversations. Now we have a gig economy. And before, unemployment insurance wasn't open to those right. individuals. Um, the social contract of our country has to change. And it's being forced to change because of what we're doing. And I would say, um, why all the talk? I think because a lot of times we are in these individual silos and um, we don't really look systemically. We create a program, we create a pilot, we create, and, and, and even the concept, I had a conversation about charter schools earlier this week. The intention was to say, are there new and creative things that we can do? And then we replicate that across the system, but we don't tend to make bold systemic changes. And that's why I feel like COVID-19 made us make some bold systemic changes. The concept even of a universal, um, the basic income is one that people laughed about. Mm -hmm. Now everybody's, now if you look at the investments that we made bipartisan through the CARES Act and the other bills that we passed, the poverty rate, you would think during COVID-19, the poverty rate would have gone up. But it was an article in the New York Times yesterday that said the poverty rate has gone down some. It's because we did a comprehensive, bold, in both investment and shifting of how we do things. We changed the rules so that people could do telehealth. We were flexible in how we provided the funding. And so I think what has to happen is that we have to get away from this incremental, here's a little program, here's a little pilot, that's why we created this caucus because I wanted us to get in the room and hash it out. Mm -hmm. Talk about, okay, from my perspective, this is the challenge with doing it this way. From my, what I've learned, this is, the, this is what works. What is evidence-based? We have all of this research out here. We don't need, we, 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 I'm looking forward to reading the paper um, that uh, Workday is putting out because it gets me excited. Uh -huh. But we need that same energy and enthusiasm across the board for everyone. And baked into that has to be issues of racial justice, wealth, you know, wealth um, equity. Mm -hmm. Those things have to be the foundation. And then we build on top of that. Got That's it. what gets me excited about doing this work because I wanna see all boats lifted. And, and I wanna see us have a North Star, a vision as a country that we can get there. And we're gonna need it. And as we go into recovery of, of, of what we're seeing, not just from a health standpoint, but an economic standpoint. Yeah, we're definitely gonna talk about that on our next panel. We have some folks who are you know, sort of outlining policies they wanna see so that the recovery is inclusive, um, unlike it's been in past recoveries. Um, I wanna take a question from our audience. And can I say one last thing? Oh, of course. Also about leadership and vision. Any of the major transformational things that have happened in this country, it was because of leadership and vision. It, 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 it like met the moment mm -hmm. and that's what we need. We need to meet this moment. So yes, your question. Yes, um, this is from Carmen Guzman. She says, um, I'm wondering please what you see as the opportunities for greater employment within and among the US, Canada and Mexico as we seek to bring manufacturing back given the great dependency on China we discovered as a result of COVID? Mm, that's a great question, Carmen. Hello, Carmen. Um, you know, I think that one of the reasons why the future of work also has been important is because we are in, globalization is real. And these are, these are our neighbors. And I think that part of that um, really ties back to leadership. Um, you know, we've seen with, um, uh, I, I can't, it feels like 15 years ago that we were discussing trade um, and, and making sure that um, the USMCA actually happened. Um, it, 
you know, it's funny how the, everything sort of has taken a back page to this, but that was really what that whole conversation was about, was the fact that we are uh, partners with Canada and Mexico, they're on our borders, um, and there are things that we need to make sure that we're looking at labor issues, that we're looking at environmental issues, that, we, that we're looking at, um, you know, enforcement. And I think it presents opportunities, but again, it kind of goes back to leadership and vision and, and how, how, how we even see those partners. Um, I think, again, COVID-19 is also showing us um, where we stand. Are we gonna be alone as the United States or are we gonna be part of a world? Um, and so, so yeah, um, Carmen, I think there are gonna be issues of um, enforcement of, uh, of our, our reciprocal labor laws, as well as our, the things that are of values for us, um, as well as our neighbors. Uh, so I don't know if that helps, um, but I also know, uh, I, I, I have known of Carmen before and uh, call me if I didn't answer your question fully. She's a regular, I guess. Yes. Um, so on that topic of, you know, whether the U.S. is going to go it alone, you know, one way that companies today fill the skills gap in tech specifically is to employ foreign workers on H-1B visas. And just yesterday, President Trump put a hold on H-1B and other visas um, and through the end of the year. So I wanted to get a chance to get your, your take on that move. Yeah, I think, I think this is a serious problem. Um, it, it, from a tech perspective and a healthcare perspective, um, you know, we actually were discussing this in our staff meeting this morning, trying to understand the full ramifications uh, of, of what is being proposed. Um, one of the things I can say, again, from a bipartisan perspective, you know, my colleagues and I sometimes differ on, um, on you know, the how you get there in terms of immigration reform. But the reality is, I think we all recognize that our country, just demographically, we are aging. Um, we are having, um, you know, skills gap issues, and we need and depend on um, a, a, an immigration system that will allow for for folks to come and work in our country and um, do it in a way that helps support uh, support us. And so, um, this this is hot off the press, uh, as, as you just mentioned. We're looking at at the ramifications. What I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful, and, and this is true on many issues, that, um, that my Republican colleagues um, will um, come together with us to share our concerns about this. Because I, I, I feel that, especially on issues of immigration um, and making sure that we have a strong economy, it, it's not just a moral issue, it's also an economic issue. And so, um, yeah, we, we haven't had a chance to speak yet across uh, across uh, the, the, the um, that's another thing that stopped as a result of COVID-19. I'm part of a bipartisan working group in Congress that actually sits down and discusses issues like immigration and infrastructure, because there are things that we have in common, um, but it's just the how to get there. And um, this to me is a step in the wrong direction, unfortunately. It do you think that any of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle agree with you on that? I, I do. I, I do. I think they, now will they speak up? That's a different story. But, but I know that, um, you know, in conversations with them, that there is this common goal. Um, even my freshman class, we started to have uh, bipartisan events and conversations and immigration was one of the areas where we did find common ground. I come from a state that not only has banking, but also has farming. You know, we have a healthcare industry, we have a tech industry. And so, um, you know, again, beyond the, um, you know, beyond the, whether you think it's a moral issue or not, it's also an economic issue. And, and I believe we have common ground. I'm just not sure that um, folks feel that they can or would speak up about it. All right. So uh, since we are in election season uh, and you happen to be family friend of another famous Delaware politician, uh, Vice President Joe Biden, I wanted to ask uh, what guidance you have given him or that you plan on giving him about these issues of workforce development and inclusion in the future of work. Well, you know, first of all, I am really proud to, you know, have known him for over 30 years and, and uh, be working with him uh, as he embarks on this big, big, big 
big moment. I, I um, you know, I've shared with him um, my desire that the future of work is something that um, really presents an opportunity right now. As I mentioned, as we transition from recovery to reimagining what um, our country could look like. And part of the conversations we're having is about that new social contract. Um, what does it look like? And how do we support uh, businesses? And as you said, and how do businesses um, support uh, the overall you know, country? Um, so we're having those conversations and I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the research that's coming out because we try to feed all of that into into the, the body of the work. And, you know, I guess my message to everybody, because I know I have to go because I'm in a committee mm -hmm. at the same time is that um, he, when I talked to him about running right before he announced, um, it was, you could tell that for him, it wasn't something that it was, you know, oh, I plan to do this, but he felt that the moment required it and that he wanted to be of service. And, that was pre-COVID-19 and that was pre, you know, us having our, our, our racial awaken, uh, uh, awakening here and reckoning. And I feel now more than ever, um, we need leaders that are gonna both recognize that it is a global society. We are part of a larger, you know, world um, that recognize that we have to deal with pandemics and, um, and our economy um, in a just way, um, and that we are each doing our individual part. And, and that's all I would ask for anybody that's um, watching this is um, just do your part, hold up a mirror to yourself. And if you are part of a company or a think tank, ask yourself, what, what are we doing internally? What, 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 what uncomfortable conversations are we having? How are we on hiring? Um, and not just hiring, but people being able to progress and move up in the company or, or in, the, in the organization. And, and to me, it presents a moment for us um, to, to, to really, again, look in the mirror, look at each other and come together to build a stronger nation. That gives me hope. That gives me hope. Even being a part of this gives me hope. So thank you for all of the work that you're doing. Um, know that while we are in the midst of um, this really challenging time, it really presents an opportunity for us to be bold, creative, um, evidence-based, um, and equitable, and, and, and try to lift all boats. That's it. That's my message. Do your part. Yeah. Well, thank you, Congressman Woman, for doing your part, and we will let you get back to your hearing. Um, for everyone who's watching at home, we're going to take a second to switch over and get our next round of panelists uh, for our Future of Skills panel. So you will see a quick hold screen, and then we will be right back. All right, it's like we never left. We are back <laughs> for uh, part two. This is our Future of Skills panel. And uh, if you are just joining us, uh, you can enter any questions you have for our panelists down in the Q&A section on Zoom. And if you're joining us on another live stream, you can send us your questions on Twitter and the hashtag is transformation of work. So uh, if you were with us at the top of the, of the summit, uh, Tammy talked a little bit about how COVID has transformed the way we work in the near term, uh, but this, that this isn't really what we're going to discuss right now. We're talking about the longer term changes in, in the economy, the things that preceded the COVID-19 pandemic and that will in all likelihood be exacerbated by the pandemic as well. So we're gonna talk about how in-demand skills are changing and how a combination of schools and nonprofits and governments and businesses can address those changes. And so I have a really interesting panel with me today. Uh, I'm gonna run through the introductions pretty quickly. 
First, we have Maria Flynn, who is the CEO of Jobs for the Future, and that is a nonprofit that organizes educational and economic development programs to expand opportunities for underserved populations. And we have Dr. Becky Takeda Tinker. She is president of Colorado State University Global, which is the country's first fully online, fully accredited public university. And it was just announced that Dr. Takeda Tinker will be taking on the role of Chief Educational Innovation Officer for the whole Colorado State University system. We have Matthew Siegelman, who is CEO of Burning Glass Technologies. He is our resident guy. Uh, and Burning Glass Technologies is an analytics company specializing in job growth, in-demand skills, and labor market trends. And we have Lisa Stevens, who is Chief People Officer for Aon, which is a professional services firm specializing in risk retirement and health services. Thank you all for joining me. All right. So, um, Maria, I wanted to start with you. You have been working on labor issues for many, many years now, um, long before your time at Jobs for the Future. You were working at the Labor Department during the 1991 recession. So, you know, as well as anyone, that these conversations about reskilling workers tend to happen pretty cyclically. Um, so, what, in your opinion, are the biggest barriers to actually closing that skills gap at scale? Is it is it a lack of resources? Is it a lack of agreement about what skills you need? Is it a lack of coordination? Walk us through that. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a great point. Uh, I think we have learned a lot, both from the 91 recession, from the 08 recession as well. Um, I think most recently, I think what's important to look at, and the prior speaker talked about how, you know, the COVID crisis has really magnified a lot of you know, um, inequities and challenges that were pre-existing, right? And so if you look at the, even the unemployment rate from six or nine months ago, right, we were at historically low unemployment numbers, but the story right. underneath those numbers really wasn't told uh, well and a lot, you know, the inequities that existed um, among those workers, the folks who were being left behind in the economic recovery, folks who were working, you know, multiple jobs to make ends meet. And, you know, the current situation is really just shining a light on a lot of those issues and, and making them um, even more challenging. And I think there's, you know, there's a number of reasons why, um, you know, I think we need to do better. Uh, one is uh, a lot of these public systems and programs that folks are relying on are really built on an infrastructure that was designed back, you know, during the time of the New Deal um, and programs that have not, you know, kept pace with the change. Um, the Congresswoman noted, you know, some of the bold moves that Congress made um, in the initial recovery around income support to individuals and some of those things that, you know, a year ago folks would have thought were you know, never going to happen, right, which happened. So I do think we need more of that boldness and that innovative thinking moving forward. I do think it is fundamentally like it has been challenging to get comprehensive reform because, you know, frankly, a lot of the folks who sit in those seats of leadership within those systems are often the ones who are resistant to that change, right? A lot of times it's hard to reimagine or innovate yourself possibly out of a job, but I think it is those types of kind of fundamental conversations that need to happen. Um, and just a few weeks ago, JFF issued a federal policy framework to, uh, in support of an equitable economic recovery that outlines some ways that we think that both federal and state policymakers can, can really do it differently this time and look at some of these issues um, in a new and bolder way. I would love it if you could walk us through what some of the pillars of that framework are and then talk about, you know, in the recovery packages that we've seen so far, how how effectively are lawmakers incorporating those ideas into their response? Yeah, absolutely. So the, we have three pillars in our framework. The first is um, really helping people rebound and advance in the economy. So that includes things like skills-based hiring, innovative financing strategies, strong uh, safety nets and supports for workers and their families. Maria, can you just can you just define skills based hiring because I think we're going to talk about that a lot today. Yeah, and no, absolutely, absolutely. So you know, I think it's a term that has uh, really kind of grown in usage over the past two years or so, and it really is asking employers to base their hiring practices on the skills and competencies that 
individuals have versus using degrees like as that signal, right? So how do we move beyond the traditional four-year degree as the main kind of hiring criteria and instead really digging underneath. This is where Matt will chime in. They've done great work around this and really starting to define like what are those skills um, that the worker needs and how to show that they have them. And I think there's probably a longer discussion for another time, but there's a big role for technology to play in that for sure. Um, the second pillar is around revitalizing inclusive regional economies, right? Because at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the labor market that the individual kind of lives in and those systems and programs and partners that are in that regional economy. So how do we help make the right connections at the regional level through sector-based strategies, through um, job quality efforts and others. And then the last one is around, you know, just this idea of how do you fundamentally redesign the nation's education and workforce systems to meet the challenges of today and, and moving forward. Um, and I think it was mentioned previously that, you know, there's been, you know, probably five or seven years of talk about the future of work. And I think um, Andrew Yang spoke at our event a couple of weeks ago, and he said, you know, we've seen 10 years of change in 10 weeks, right? And so I think a lot of those things that people were talking about is like, oh, this is, this could happen in the future of work, right? We've saw a lot of those things, you know, uh, fall uh, in our laps here over the past uh, few months. And I think the challenge is, I think, for us to, you know, policymakers and all of us to really stop kind of talking and like debating the issues and really start to take the actions that are needed to to make the changes that are necessary. So I thank you, Maria. I want to um, transition over to, to Matthew. As you said, you know, you guys, your firm specializes in surfing data on the job market so it can be used by governments, so it can be used by employers. Um, so what is the research telling you right now about what the most in-demand skills are independent of the pandemic? And then also how prevalent those skills are in the workforce. In other words, is there a real skills gap? Is it that people don't have these skills in the workforce or is it that those skills just aren't being recognized? Um, great question. Um, so first I think um, we should level set and it seems weird to be talking about skills gaps in, in an environment where 40 million people have been displaced from work over the last uh, few months. But nonetheless, um, you're right to start there because um, skills gaps are real. Uh, I've done a bunch of work for the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation where uh, we looked at this question and found that, in fact, in some fields, the number of jobs, at least in the pre-COVID world, um, exceeded the number of people with the right sets of skills by 50% or more, for example, in some areas of, of healthcare. Um, that said, we tend to think about uh, the skills gap with a definite article in front of it, the, the skills gap. And, and in fact, there is no single gap. Um, you know, it's, it's not a singular problem, but it's a plural problem. Different skills have different gaps. Um, what are some of the skills that where we see those kinds of gaps? Certainly there's uh, sets of skills like data skills, coding skills, cybersecurity skills that are in intense demand and continue to be in very significant demand, um, even with um, the level of, of hiring activity in the market significantly off where it was. Um, Part of what you're seeing, though, and, and I'm glad Maria talked about kind of the acceleration of, of the future of work, because one of the things that we'd already been seeing a lot and we're seeing speed up um, over the last few months is the notion that um, jobs change very quickly. Um, there's just uh, there's some occupations where literally over the last uh, decade, 40% of the job requirements, 40% of the skills have changed in, in a short period of time. And I think um, that's a profound rate of change and it uh, has profound implications for companies in terms of how they uh, ensure that the workforce, their workforce stays relevant. It's profound implications for workers in figuring out how they can continue to have, uh, to be competitive for opportunity, particularly in a market that's increasingly competitive. Um, so it's not surprising then when you see that kind of level of change where jobs are changing, the nature of jobs are combining new sets of skills, um, that a lot of people, the people in the workforce don't necessarily have the skills that employers are looking to see for the future. Um, another important part of this, though, is that we tend to think about those kinds of skills that are in shortest supply 
as being, uh, again, those kind of data skills, the uh, coding skills, the cybersecurity skills and the like, which, you know, we're, we're all used to thinking about. But it's also worth noting that um, we're seeing an increasing and, frankly, an increasingly unrequited demand for human skills. Um, in fact, the jobs that are most often gapped um, have significantly higher demand for creativity skills. They have significantly higher demand for collaboration skills. They have significantly higher demand for writing skills, for research skills. The list goes on. Um, the, the last thing to bear in mind when we talk about skill gaps is this, that it's kind of like this, um, uh, I, you know, it, it, this is both the kind of the biggest tragedy, but I think also the biggest opportunity right now for us is um, it's that thing that you're, you always see in your driver's side mirror that says, uh, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. Uh, and often people and opportunity are only a couple of skills apart. Uh, and so I think the, the real opportunity, or so on the one hand that's tragic, right, because you can see people who are um, struggling in the, in the job market who right now may have been displaced. Um, and then you look at opportunities, which again, there's, you know, we think about the last few months of the desert, but even at the depths of the crisis, um, there was still 58% of the, of the hiring activity there was pre-crisis. So um, there's always been some demand, and, and some of those jobs are really only a couple of skills away. So the question is, how do we make sure that people have transparency about what are the skills that they can acquire quickly and on the fly? And then also to Maria's point, what are the, um, the training structures, what are the institutional structures that enable people to acquire those sets of skills quickly and on the fly. Right. And I know one other concern that you guys have had and looked into is that the most in-demand jobs right now in this moment with COVID-19, the drivers, the warehouse workers, healthcare workers, aren't jobs that are necessarily going to last past the pandemic. So how do we mitigate the risk of a whole lot of people going back to work while the jobs that surged during the pandemic um, fade away and some people now find themselves out of work? I think um, a key to this is recognizing that um, a lot of our mental model for workforce training is once and done. Okay, we've got people who really need a job, we better help them find a job, and okay, great, they're in a job, we're done. Um, well, the fact that somebody takes a job as a contact tracer or, or working in a, um, in a retail warehouse or whatever it may be, um, you know, great, they, they, at least they're getting a paycheck. They can hopefully afford to feed their family with it. Um, but it's not going to be the kind of job that's uh, going to give them upward mobility and, and the kind of opportunity that they may have been previously accustomed to. Um, so the real question then is how do we support workers not only in um, getting what we call a lifeboat job, uh, right, like you're in the, the you know, Titanic in the middle of the North Atlantic, you're not choosy, you get into a lifeboat. Uh, but how do we help make sure that people continue to have access to the skill development that allows them to get ultimately to a rescue ship? Because you're not going to cross the North Atlantic in the middle of the winter in a lifeboat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, you know, I'll give you an example of taking someone, taking someone taking a job as a contact tracer. Uh, right, it's a relatively low skill job. Um, but on the other hand, when you look at the skill DNA of that job as a contact tracer, there's a whole bunch of jobs that somebody can move onward to take, whether in, uh, in social services, in terms of uh, intake interviews and that kind of stuff, whether in terms of customer service or even sales, which may be more durable and better paying. Uh, or take the example of, of a server in a restaurant who's lost her job, takes her job in the, takes a job in the Amazon warehouse, Ultimately, can we help her acquire the skills to continue moving along and go from there to a career in logistics, which actually may ultimately have been a lot better paying than the job that she was originally in. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Dr. Takeda Tinker, I wanted to, to move on to you. Um, obviously, educational institutions are gonna have to play a big role in filling these gaps. And this is something that we haven't really talked about yet today. Um, the role of educational institutions. So, um, you know, you ran CSU Global, um, which 
a lot of people are going to be looking to now as a model of online education. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the student body at CSU Global differs from the rest of the CSU system and how you've tried to tailor the curriculum so that it does funnel people toward these in-demand skills? Yes, great. Thank you. And thank you again for having me on this panel with Matt and with Maria and Lisa. I appreciate that. CSU Global's student body on average is 35 years old, children in the household. They mostly have some sort of job. They are working and they are busy. Their biggest challenges are time and money. And they're learning. The reason it's fully online and, and asynchronous is because that's what meets their needs. When we think about what Matt just said about always learning and you get a one job and you've got to keep moving, it is about how do you accommodate and incorporate learning into your life as an ongoing thing. You're not just arriving in one and done, not at all into the future. And so CSU Global's entire culture is about how do we help learners help themselves and help them to understand how to self-advocate, how to get the support that they need. Everything is there. It's all incorporated in the per credit cost, per credit hour. Um, they don't need anything external. There are no other issues uh, in terms of live tutoring, live tech support. We provide all of that, uh, live access to the library 24 seven. So career counseling, it's, it's on demand and it's when they need it. And that type of culture has enabled us to have retention that's more than double the industry average and our completion rates are high because we look at the learner and we've created an environment that supports them in their very, very, very busy lives trying to juggle. And now with COVID, they're also juggling homeschooling yeah. with their kids um, and trying to find a job if they have one or working very, very hard because they're covering more than one job. So that type of environment is what has been successful for our learners. And we incorporated it so that they understand that they can come in at any time. We see our busiest times in our classrooms at 10 at night and on the weekends, that they can keep learning, keep growing, and keep moving forward. And we also have programs that allow them to stack so they could start with a certificate program and complete, maybe take a rest or go deal with something, you know, a sick family member, and then come back again. We offer a school year round in eight week compressed sessions. So it allows them to plan for time and money and to be able to complete their goals and stack. And so when we think about Matt, uh, Matthew, uh, about how we keep them learning, and I, I really loved what Representative Blunt said about incentives to upskilling. I was really in, intrigued on that because if we can keep rewarding them as they keep stacking and keep learning and they feel like, and they see the results of the outcomes of their work, that is self-motivating in, in and of itself. And I think what we see when we think about the learners that we've been helping, you know, some of that 36 million, some college, no degree at the bachelor's level. We also have master's degrees, but at the bachelor's level in particular, that they've started and not, and had to keep repeating the same coursework. You know, so they start, stop, start, stop, and they're not really getting ahead. And the ability for higher education institutions to be able to recognize learning from wherever it came as legitimate learning based on demonstrated outcomes, that there's value in that, rewards the learner for having learned and they can keep progressing and see the rewards finally for their hard work. And I, I think that that type of environment is really helpful to them. And I wanted to ask about how you guys get feedback also from employers and from, from companies yeah. about the skills that they're looking for and how yep. you funnel that into the curriculums. So when we think about time and money, they, our adult learners want some sort of return on investment for that time and money. And so we are, because of our mission of workplace success through higher education, we work with industry leaders across the nation and the world actually, so that we are very clear on where they're hiring now and where they see the future going so that we are building those programs continually meeting those needs, including building in industry certifications so that the learner has the return on investment and the employer actually knows that they have credentialed uh, employees, that we are um, understanding what the industry tools are, tech tools, and what do those students need to be able to work with so that they can get a job once they finish their uh, certificate program or their degree program. So that that uh, tight relationship with employers, we have over 3,000 of them, and we have created custom programs, uh, small uh, programs where they have organizational training that has real value 
where we can provide collegiate credit and that student can then uh, finish or that employee can finish a certificate with us or a degree program with us after they've completed what their employer wants. So it's understanding what the market needs are. That helps our students and we fill in the gaps inside of that. And I think uh, what Matthew brought up on you know, how do we assess, or I think Maria, how do we assess what's out there and what they need? Well, mm -hmm. micro learning is that future. And if employers can start to move towards competency-based hiring, the technology can assess for that. And then higher education, you know, in public, my background's business, and I am now, I do have a PhD and I am in education, but what I've been so impressed with in public education is the passion and sheer devotion that people in public education have to really make sure that learners are learning. There is nothing like that. And I, I quite frankly was surprised at that level of dedication. And so when we can combine that type of passion with meeting market needs and filling in those gaps where employers say that this is what they want an employee and we can all work together to make sure that that employee is equipped, people are working. And they are growing and moving into the next job. So that collaborative environment is, is where global works. And definitely into the future, we see that that's how uh, students can be successful and get that return on investment that they need in their very busy lives. Great. And Lisa, I want to bring you in as our resident large employer on the panel. Um, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about what are the hardest skills for a company like Aon to hire for. I saw you nodding when Matthew was saying a lot of the skills that are hardest are the sort of human interpersonal skills. Um, so what are the skills that are hardest to hire for? And then how do you signal to the market um, what you need, whether it's educational institutions like CSU Global or workforce development programs? How do you let them know, you know, this is what we, you, we need, um, help us get there? I think I'll, I'll put a bow on this whole conversation in the last uh, hour and just say that um, the thing that's most impressive about it is it's really about action. So it's much less about like, how do you make a difference? And so just tying in, um, Doctor, what you just talked about, um, for us, we recognize at Aon that we had an opportunity where we didn't want to just look at our four-year college graduates, but where and how could we build skills? So we started a program back in 2017 with Accenture and it's an apprentice program where ba basically people can learn and earn at the same time through partnerships with city colleges. And by doing that, it's a two year program. Uh, the, pe the, the, um, the candidates come into the program, they work at Aon and then they also attend school to gain the skills that they might need. And again, they can evolve and change depending upon what the needs of our organization are. Um, the big thing is action, right? So one of the things that we did is we scaled it. So we scaled it to 40 other companies over the last couple of years so that we could increase the number of people going into the program. Again, not the traditional four-year college person, but someone that maybe has some skills, but not, not all of them, um, to attract different people into the workforce. So it seems like that kind of wraps up a lot of the conversation we are talking about today, where an organization saw an opportunity, partnered with um with local colleges and also with other businesses to say, how do we scale this so that we can get to a larger population of people that might otherwise be lost or stuck in a, stuck in a place where they wouldn't have the opportunity. Got it. And, and while you have this, um, this captive audience of, of nonprofit education and uh, data analysts, are there um, things that you would like to ask them for, like skills that are in demand that you want to hire for or um, partnerships or, you know, types of training programs that you're interested in working with? What, what kind of help can this, this group offer to an employer right now? I think the human skills is still a really big deal. And I know Matt, you brought that up and that was why I smiled. It, um, because people are so comfortable with texting uh, and maybe not as much of the conversations that used to happen, the opportunity to get people to connect again, it can be virtually, virtual like this, but encouraging educators uh, when you're doing more online training that there's a lot of presentations and interaction going on so that when the, the new candidates come in, they have that comfort level that maybe they weren't getting as much or haven't been getting as much in the past with this generation that we have that's so focused on technology. So I push on the human element of, of connecting people uh, and that of EQ, the emotional intelligence of, of helping people to build those skills. 
All right, well, I see that we are at our time. So I really appreciate all of our panelists for joining us and Workday for sponsoring us. And we hope you all will join us soon on our next virtual event at Protocol. Thank you.